Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, January 25th, 2007. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. Well, this week we head into the world of scientific research to improve our smelling skills. Researcher Jay Gottfried joins us to tell us about an experiment that he's been conducting that apparently sharpens the ability of test subjects to detect and differentiate smells. We'll ask Dr. Gottfried how we can take what he's learned and apply it to our hobby of home brewing. Well, before I forget, I want to remind mead lovers that the 5th International Mead Festival is coming up Valentine's Day weekend. That's February 9th and 10th in Denver, Colorado. Next week, we'll have an interview with David Myers of Redstone Meadery to fill us in on the details, but I wanted to give you a chance to mark your calendars now. The International Mead Festival, February 9th and 10th in Denver. Check out meadfest.com for more information. I wish I could be there. Uh, We're planning on having our buddy Brian Warren cover the event again this year, and no promises on whether he's going to wear a kilt. Lots of mail this week. I apologize to everybody who's emailed recently. I've been swamped uh, with goings on around here, and and I've been a little slow to get back to you. But uh, I do appreciate all the notes, and uh, I hope you'll be patient while I catch up. Scott from Tampa, Florida, wrote in with a question about our episode on gluten-free beer with the brewers from Dark Hills Brewery uh, here in northwest Arkansas. Scott says, I just listened to your gluten-free episode I didn't hear any mention of if they were using off-the-shelf yeasts or if they are developing their own strains. And also, do gluten-free beers ferment differently as far as speed, alcohol conversion, etc.? Well, good questions. I wish I'd have thought of those while we were talking to uh, Connie and Lee there at the the future brewery. Uh, Lee Nogi from Dark Hills responded. She says, we use the standard Fermentus Saf brand yeasts, saff lager, and saff ale. These are dried yeasts grown on molasses extract before drying for packaging and are gluten-free, unlike the liquid yeasts that can be purchased off the shelf. Lee says one thing to be avoided is many passages of yeast. It's okay to culture enough for use in one batch. However, if passed from brew to brew, and Lee says I'm not certain how many passages, the yeast can genetically self-generate gluten proteins according to research by Roger A. Mushy, M-U-S-S-H-E. And I hope I'm fairly close in pronouncing that. I don't know. Uh, Lee says, our plan in large-scale production is to closely monitor our yeast using the Ritascreen ELISA assay to determine the passage potential of our yeast before becoming glutinous. For home brewing, we suggest one packet to be started directly in four to five gallons of wort, Fermentus brand is very reliable, Lee says, and starts immediately. We found the gluten-free beers to ferment the same as barley beers. Each beer has its own schedule that makes it unique. On average, our starting gravity is about uh, 1050 and ending is 1012. So we have just under 5% alcohol in our beers. And that may, this is me talking, that may may have to do with uh, state regulations uh, as well. Lee says, our beers are racked twice and are finished between two to three weeks. Primary fermentation is about five days. Of course, our lager requires a week longer in the cold and one extra racking. So thanks to Lee for taking time to respond. Jerry from Oak Creek, Wisconsin writes, Just listened to your podcast on gluten-free brewing. Just thought I would pass on to you information about Lakefront Brewery in Milwaukee, Wisconsin which has been distributing its version of a gluten-free beer for some time now. So you might want to check that out if you're in the Milwaukee area, Lakefront Brewery with a gluten-free beer. Uh, Jerry continues, also in your craft brew versus homebrew debate. Homebrew has been a term used in the amateur radio community for decades. Amateur radio operators have a long history of building their own equipment, radios and antennas, at home, Technology advancements have made homebrewing a bit more difficult to a certain extent. However, there is a whole lot of experimentation and satisfaction as you build it yourself. This is what makes it truly homebrew. Homebrew in regards to beer is no different, Jerry says. Homebrew is beer brewed through process and experimentation by you, the amateur, at home. Technology advancements have helped make the process as amateur brewers easier, 
Homebrew is the ownership and pride that goes with it. The method, extract, partial mash, or all grain is insignificant. Jerry says craft brew, on the other hand, would refer to the intermediate stage between the amateur home brewer and the professional, Jerry says, term lo- used loosely, mega swill producers. Uh, craft brew is taking your home brew to the next level, ownership, pride, and an income because you are that good at it. So another angle on the terminology discussion. I appreciate that, Jerry. Uh, by the way, there are also homebrew computer programmers as well, I believe. Tim from Gibsonia, Pennsylvania writes, uh, listening to your interview with Charlie Papazian was very interesting, in particular keeping a single yeast on hand to give both lager or ale characteristics depending on the fermenting temperature. I realize Charlie has his own yeast, but I was wondering what other yeasts can be used like this. Well, um, for this one, I went right to the source, and I uh, forwarded the question to Charlie Papazian. And Charlie says, any lager yeast could be used this way. The results may be good or not, depending on how the lager yeasts react with the warmer fermentation. And Charlie says, ale yeasts cannot uh, because they do not ferment at lager temperatures. So there you go. I appreciate Charlie's continued help. So lager, ye- lager uh, yeasts can be used in both ways, uh, but uh, ale yeasts cannot because they, uh, they apparently can't stand the cold, according to Charlie. John from Houston writes in. He says, I was given an extract kit that appears to be three years old. I took it because, well, I did not want to seem ungrateful. The extract is leaking at the lid, which tells me that this container is not sealed. I know the yeast is no good, as it is three years old. There is specialty grain in a muslin bag, hop pellets, and a dry white powder. My questions are this. Is the grain still good? Do hop pellets spoil? What is the white powder? Could the extract still be good if the container is not sealed? I have trouble tossing this stuff, but hate to throw anything of value away. Well, John, I don't think there's much of value in that kit, uh, besides possibly the muslin bag (laughs) after you take the grain out. Uh, At three years old, if the liquid extract isn't sealed, it's probably stale and possibly infected with some sort of food poisoning. So it may may be bad for you. Uh, Hops lose their flavor and aroma over time and, and, you know, grain stales as well. And you might be able to resuscitate the yeast with a starter, but, you know, why go through all the trouble? And the white powder, could it be, could it be gypsum, uh, yeast nutrient? I don't know. If it's not labeled, chunk it. Um, one of the most important things in home brewing is to use fresh ingredients. So don't feel guilty. Throw that stuff away and get yourself a fresh new kit. You'd probably be wasting your time uh, otherwise if you were to brew with that three-year-old stuff that apparently has not been handled very well. Now, put on your science hat. Uh, A few weeks ago, I was listening to NPR's Science Friday, and I heard an interview about a study that I thought would be relevant to uh, homebrewing and would help us understand our sense of smell and help us to improve it. Uh, Dr. Jay Gottfried is an assistant professor of neurology at the Cognitive Neurology and Alzheimer's Disease Center at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. I asked him to come on the show to tell us how to smell better. Well, Jay Gottfried, welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. Thank you. Now, I heard you on uh, on Science Friday, and you are the second uh, Science Friday alumnus to make an appearance on this show. <laughs> uh, the first was uh, uh, Dr. Scott Herness, who okay. talked about the sense of taste. And uh, smell is equally important in brewing. There's there's several reasons, both during the during the brewing process and uh, you know with the finished product, that uh, uh, having a good keen sense of smell uh, helps. And uh, so I wanted to ask you on to kind of help us smell better, sure. at, as brewers, so to speak. Uh, first of all, I want I want to get into the uh, the study that you talked about on Science Friday. But first of all, uh, I want to just cover some basics. How does the sense of smell work? <laughs> well, uh, that's sort of the million-dollar question or, or the question that would lead to a Nobel Prize, I think. <laughs> uh, it, it's interesting. The, the sense of smell 
is probably much less well understood than many of the other senses. I think traditionally vision and hearing sort of received the most notice, probably because in humans it, those senses seem to be the most important. Uh, trying to lead a life blind uh, is generally considered to be much harder than a life without the sense of smell. Right. Although it has its disadvantages. But I, I think that my work and, and many others' work uh, is beginning to show that not only is the human sense of smell more important than we realize, but that it's capable of doing a lot more than we realize. What is the vehicle of smell? How does smell get from the source to our, our noses and then into our brains, so to speak? Right. Well, uh, most smells are a combination of different uh, molecules that are airborne, transmitted uh, into the nose, where they contact the uh, olfactory epithelium, which contains the uh, receptor endings of olfactory uh, neurons. Once these make contact with, with an odorous molecule, message is projected back through the olfactory bulb, which sort of uh, sits in the air sinus uh, and runs just below the frontal part of the brain. Uh, the next stopping point from there is in the olfactory cortex, in the, in the heart of the gray matter inside the brain at a place called the piriform cortex mainly. Um, what's interesting about these regions of the brain is they're very old evolutionary, they're very uh, old evolutionarily, uh, and you can see these structures uh, at least down to rodents, if not uh, below that. And what's curious is that uh, these olfactory regions of the brain are involved in processing smells in the service of guiding uh, appropriate behaviors. And if you think about it, in, in lower animals, even dogs and, and some primates too, uh, smell is probably one of the major signals that animals use to, to get through the day. So whether you're dealing with um, foraging behavior or trying to escape from a predator, uh, kinship selection, uh, maternal bonding, uh, and of course mating choice. All of these things uh, have at their basis smell. So these areas of the brain that process smell in humans are now have, have now been adapted in order to deal with the larger world of emotions uh, and behaviors. The other day I went into the post office and uh, someone had just uh, received a shipment or shipped out a shipment uh, that contained cedar shavings. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I walked into the post office, I immediately jumped back in my memory to a pet shop yeah. uh, from when I was a kid. And it was a very powerful uh, sensory experience. Is that because it's kind of tied into that old part of the brain that's uh, uh, responsible for more survival uh, instincts? I, I think so. Uh, it's hard to prove that, but I do think that the the smell circuits are so intimately connected to regions that process emotion and memory that uh, they can sort of transport you right back uh, to your childhood in a very powerful way. And uh, interestingly, many of the memories that a smell will trigger are rather emotional and very personal memories. Are we in talking to a Dr. Herness, uh, he said that on the tongue there are basically four uh, different tastes. Are there different uh, categories of smells that you deal with, or can you can you pigeonhole different categories of smells? Well, that, that's probably another million dollar question. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> certainly, the uh, sense of smell is much more complex than taste, and in fact. Uh, many people don't realize that when you put a food or a beer or an ale in your mouth, uh, much of that experience is actually happening happening at the nose. The uh, as you said, the the tongue can sense sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and savory. But beyond that, all the subtle nuances coming from the hops and the malt, all of that requires olfactory. 
processing. So as you uh, sip the beer, for example, you aerate the fluid in your mouth and uh, bring the, the odor molecules up into the nose sort of in a backwards direction and allow you to pick up all the subtleties uh, coming from the fluid. So, uh, you know, if, if you were judging the uh, sweetness content of a pale ale, um, that's happening at the tongue. But if you're trying to figure out how uh, minty or hoppy or chocolatey uh, that beer was, uh, you're really using your nose uh, for most of it. Now, you're, you're sounding to me like a beer lover yourself, are you? <laughs> I, I uh, enjoy the occasional beer. <laughs> well, good, good. Uh, well, let's get, back, let's get into your survey or your study, and uh, maybe we can start to kind of uh, use the information that you, that you discovered to help us be uh, better beer tasters and, and beer smellers. Okay. Uh, tell us about the study that you talked about. Well, uh, the study that we, we've been working on is trying to understand the role of experience in how we come to learn about the world of smells. If you think about it, when you're walking through life day by day, uh, you, don't, you don't encounter a smell and then try and study it and try and learn about it. It sort of happens passively, but as it turns out, the human nose can probably differentiate 100,000 different smells. We may not be able to name them all, but we can certainly tell them all apart. In fact, if you take an odor molecule uh, that differs only by one single carbon, one single carbon atom, you're still able to tell that they're different. Hmm. So we're, we're very good at telling things apart. And the question we, we posed is, can sensory experience be sufficient to help you learn about smell. So what we did is we gave uh, human volunteers a set of different smells uh, in a sort of a before session and an after session. And then in between those two points, the critical, uh, the critical moment was uh, presenting one smell for three and a half minutes continuously to their nose. And we asked the subject to inhale through the nose. Um, don't try and identify the smell. Just focus on it, but, but not try and uh, use your brain too much in processing it. Uh, and we had them provide some ratings of how strong it seemed. What we found is that after exposure to that one smell, you became an expert for the category of smells that you had experienced during the exposure. So in other words, Let's say I put you uh, through the experiment uh, and gave you a minty smell, such as a spearmint-like smell. After that three-minute exposure, you would become a mint expert. And now if I gave you uh, different smells in the family of mint, spearmint, peppermint, and so forth, you would be better able to tell those apart. On the other hand, if I gave you a flowery smell, you would become a flower expert. So we found a kind of specificity for this. So depending on which odor you had experienced, you would become a, a relative expert for that uh, perceptual quality or note. So it's kind of practice makes perfect. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I guess sort of the, the punchline would be, you know, let your nose do the work, uh, your brain will do the rest. <laughs> now, when we were in junior high, uh, there was an experiment where uh, the subject of the experiment closed his or her eyes and something pungent like uh, a slice of uh, orange or something was held beneath the nose of the subject. And it continued to be held there for, you know, a, a period of time. And the subject was supposed to say when, when the orange was taken away from them. Mm -hmm. And if you just held the, the orange under the person's nose eventually they would say, okay, it's away. In other words, there was a, there was a smell fatigue factor there. Right. You know, they, and, and they would quit, per, they would stop perceiving that, uh, that smell. Uh, it seems like to me that if you were exposed to a background uh, smell for three minutes, that the fatigue factor would, would work in there as well. Definitely. Uh, in, in science speak, we refer to that as habituation. 
Um, and it's true that during the three-minute exposure, the volunteers did habituate to the smell. Um, I think that process itself probably contributes to this whole learning mechanism. Uh, but in order to make sure that the fatigue did not interfere with our testing, we actually waited about 30 minutes until retesting the subjects hmm. just to make sure that their nose had recovered. So after they were exposed for three minutes, they gave a they were given a rest period. Yeah. Uh, and then were uh, asked to smell the samples of mint or or floral, right. whichever family they were tested exactly. in, and they were able to perceive the differences in those uh, more acutely. More acutely. Was there a control where? Uh, yeah, there 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 was an internal control. So uh, every volunteer received mint smells and flower smells in the pre- and post-test periods. So we were able to look at how exposure influenced uh, mint discriminations and also flower discriminations. So a mint expert would not have shown changes for the flower odors and vice versa. And how long do these effects last? In our study, we looked as long as 24 hours. So, so we had uh, some of the subjects come back a day later, and the learning effect was still present. Hmm. Uh, and this was only with a single three-minute exposure. So the effect seems to be pretty robust, and I wouldn't be surprised if it lasted for, for longer periods of time, even than 24 hours. After all, I think this probably underlies much of the way by which we piece together more complex, a more complex understanding about smells. So what, how did you choose the background, either minty or floral smell? Was it something fairly neutral or something fairly powerful within those families? Um, we, we tried to use fairly distinctive members of the mint and flower family that have also been used pretty regularly in the uh, olfactory uh, uh, human uh, literature. So, so something familiar to them. Um, yeah, moderately so. Yeah, the, the mint, mint is a family that's extremely familiar to people. So uh, flowers, it depends a little bit more on previous experience. So let's apply this to our our uh, uh, obsession. Uh, <laughs> okay, that's why we're here. You're right, uh, and specifically to let's. Uh, there, there are many aromas uh, in beer, good and possibly bad. If something uh, infects your beer, uh, it can give you bad aromas as well, and it's important to be able to detect and differentiate those too. Mm -hmm. But let's just say hops. If you were to try to use this technique to hone your um, your ability to detect and differentiate different uh, families of hops or different varieties of hops, how would you do that? I think that uh, you'd need to put your hops in a tumbler and stick your nose in it. <laughs> um, you know, that that's really what the study says. You know, I think that there are many factors that go into olfactory expertise, um, but if we're willing to accept the conclusions of the study, I think that if you if you just spend some quality time with the hops, um, expose your nose to it for a few minutes, um, you should you should enable your brain to develop more uh, refined representations of those smells. And the the one thing that we could get to later. Or, I can bring up now is the other part of the study, which was that these learning effects uh, took place in very ancient structures of the olfactory brain. Hmm. While the while the volunteers were smelling the different odors before, during, and after the exposure, we put them in an MRI scanner to collect their brain activity as they smelled these different things. And what we found is that the size of the response in the piriform cortex and the orbital frontal cortex, which are both these very primitive, evolutionarily conserved structures, uh, also 
uh, increased their um, representations or, or the the territory that stores information for these smells was enhanced as a result of the learning and experience. Um, so, so and you're again, the, these sorts of structures are uh, in limbic areas of the brain that are uh, closely affiliated with emotion, um, behavior, and and uh, uh, you know pleasantness and unpleasantness. So. So you're uh, modifying your brain essentially. Yeah. And and one one neat thing about our findings is it shows that smells are not totally hardwired in the brain, but that through learning learning and experience you can update this information uh, in the service of creating sort of a more uh, complex and detailed smell database. Hmm. So you can kind of retrain your brain. Uh, for, yeah. for example, there's a beer that I, I like quite a bit that's a sour beer called La Folie. Uh, and I knew that there was something about the way that it smelled uh, that I had associated with something that I'd uh, come in contact with before. But, uh, you know, I grew to like the beer quite a bit and basically forgot that I had remembered that smell before. And a friend of mine smelled the beer and said, hey, this smells like sauerkraut. And then at that point, I said, hey, you know, you're right. It smells exactly like sauerkraut. So I had, I had kind of, uh, uh, I guess, associated, reassociated that smell from sauerkraut to this right. beer. Yeah, well, that just shows how important sort of other sensory information and context plays. The, the power of suggestion is very strong with olfaction, too. Uh, if, if I gave you a smell and told you that it smelled like, uh, well, from this one study uh, by Rachel Hertz and colleagues, uh, they gave subjects a smell uh, and half the time labeled it as fresh cucumber and half the time as mildew. Mm. And depending on what word preceded the smell, even though the smell was identical, uh, subjects came away with a very different perception and um, sense of pleasantness or unpleasantness from the smell. Marketing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is marketing, but it, but you know, the mar the marketers n know their job pretty well because it it has real effects on perception, mm -hmm. whether we like it or not. Right. Now, now back to our practical mm -hmm. uh, experience. Say, if you wanted to differentiate uh, or to learn the difference between the way, say, Cascade uh, hops smell and Fuggles and uh, Amarillo. Um, if you, say, set out a, some a bowl of uh, fresh hops uh, as a potpourri in the room mm -hmm. uh, for a few minutes and then cleared that away and then brought in the samples uh, of the different hops, uh, does your study suggest that then you would uh, be more in a position to be able to differentiate and then remember the uh, the different smells from those particular varieties? I, I think so. Uh, you know, the bottom line is yes. Uh, how, how conscious all of this is, is not as clear. So whether you would be able to sort of consciously describe the changes um, may or may not be present. You based on our findings, you would probably be able to discriminate them better than before, mm -hmm. although you might not be able to communicate any rules as to how you're doing that, for example, to somebody else. But, um, it, but if you had a, a, a description, uh, I find that it's helpful for me to have a description uh, in front of me written down mm -hmm. to say, oh, yeah, that does smell citrusy, or, oh, yeah, that, that is grapefruit that's coming out of there, or, right. you know, that's a certain spice that I'm smelling. Uh, right. And if I get a prompt, you know, then it then it helps me to make that connection. Yeah, definitely. It's sort of like um, being able to tag these odors with some other marker, whether it's verbal or or visual, which allows you to uh, create, like I said before, create a more complex smell database in your head. And I would assume that this would work for unpleasant smells as well. Say, if we're trying to identify. Uh, a certain 
uh, family of infections or something that smells mm-hmm. similarly, if we, uh, uh, I don't know what the word is, but if we, if we, um, sort of trained on it. Yeah, if we if we trained ourselves with this background smell of something in the family, then that would kind of heighten our senses uh, to yeah. the smell. Right. Although I wouldn't recommend uh, deep inhalations of a bacterial-laden <laughs> beer soup. <laughs> and, you know, this the study, like all of these studies, there, there are these provisos, right? So these subjects had uh, one smell piped into their nose for three and a half minutes. So that was a pretty intense experience. Um, Do they wear face masks? or? Uh, we use uh, some plastic tubing that sits just in front of the nose, mm. uh, and it pipes in odor-scented air. So uh, probably, you know, in the natural environment, it will be a little bit more subtle. But certainly there's nothing stopping you from putting some cascade hops into a glass and smelling that for three minutes. I think part of the take-home message here is really just to uh, trust more in your nose and um, allow sensory experience to help uh, facilitate your uh, your expertise or your acuity. So, so again, our, practice one, makes one perfect. Way, one way that we've shown in our study is through sort of some continual exposure to one smell. But really just, you know, getting your nose in there and using it and trusting it and having confidence in your olfactory sense, I think, goes a long way. Um, as I mentioned before, the sense of smell uh, is not much regarded uh, in uh, among the human race, uh, and I I think that's a real detriment. You know, the fact that we're exposed to so many deodorants and air fresheners and those funny things that hang on the off the you know rear view mirror in the taxi cab. <laughs> um, all of these things are sort of dull in our appreciation, I think, for the world of smells. And if if we uh, allowed, if we allowed ourselves to encounter the natural world, the natural world of smells, uh, in a more regular and sort of moment by moment way, I think we would get more more out of it. There's interesting data to show that. Uh, women, by and large, are better smellers than men. And I think this is probably not because of any any genetic difference, but because traditionally women have been much more involved with with smelling, hmm. whether it's wearing perfume or cooking. Um, all of these things force you to use your nose and, and test and compare and you know, add, add some more seasonings. So I think all of this training and experience uh, plays a huge role in in what your nose can do. When you're tasting things, you can get, say, a piece of bread or a glass of water to uh, act as a as a palate cleanser between tastings. Is there such a thing as a, as as a, a palate cleanser for your nose? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I mean, they um, they I, have I products, know you know, like Febreze and and uh, things that are so-called odor neutralizers. But are they just masking the the odor, or is it wiping uh, it out? I, I don't I don't I don't think much is known about that. There there are certainly numerous ways that it could be working. There's this old chestnut about uh, smelling a coffee bean in between perfume samples hmm. uh, when you're at the department store, and supposedly it it helps clear the nose. Um, I, I see that I see things like that working in multiple different possible ways. One odor molecule might actually kick out another molecule from the, from its receptor site in the nose, or maybe the act of of breathing something fresh just clears the nose out. Hmm. E- even eating uh, bread or drinking water is a partial olfactory cleanser, because as I said. It's the the molecules in the food that get thrown up into the airspace of the nose that creates a lot of flavor. So if you can wash that food out of your mouth, 
either by eating bread or drinking water, then you'll remove the source of odor molecules uh, that are activating your your flavor sense. Does so, that make sense? So maybe blowing your nose too between. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Literally sure. knocking those molecules out. Yeah. But only in polite company, yeah. <laughs> or I should say, not not in polite company. <laughs> well, this is fascinating stuff, and and if nothing else, it will give us an excuse to drink more beer, <laughs> so that we can practice our uh, our uh, uh, our sensory experiences and and uh, rewire our brains uh, right. so that we can smell better. You know, one one I I also like wine, and uh, when I drink wine, and when wine experts drink wine, which is not me. Um, they like to aerate the wine in the mouth, so they draw some air past it uh, to get those molecules up and back into the nose. Uh, they don't do that for champagne because it already has bubbles in it. And, right. And that the natural fizz there will will carry the smell up into the nose from the mouth. So in the same way, I think that's one of the benefits of beer carbonation. That uh, and and it's probably one of several reasons why we appreciate beer carbonation because it helps transmit the the smell components of the beer into the nose without you having to do extra work. Of course, there's also the tactile sensation that we appreciate on the tongue. Um, but I think that uh, if if there were one one thing I'd have the listeners remember for sure is that the nose is doing most of the work uh, when you're when you're tasting a wine. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> the nose the nose is doing most of the work when you're tasting a beer. <laughs> well, we we can like wine too. It's not, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's not an exclusive club. But yeah, we can that, we that's can cross over. That's for the crushing uh, radio hour. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's for another show. Mm-hmm. Well, I certainly appreciate your time, and it's fascinating stuff. Great. Well, I hope uh, you find something useful here. Well, thanks, Jay. Now, I think that's some interesting research, and I plan to put it to use by spending lots more time with my nose in a glass of beer, all in the name of science. <laughs> uh, Jay sent me a link to a story that uh, WGN-TV did on his study, and they used wine as the reference smell. And after being exposed to the smell of wine for three minutes and having a 30-minute rest period for their interview, uh, the reporter was better able to differentiate subtle aroma differences between the wine samples. Uh, So there you go. You may want to give it a shot yourself. And thanks again to uh, Jay Gottfried. Now, while I was brewing this past weekend, I put a bowl of uh, Simcoe hop pellets on the counter as I was getting ready. And pretty soon the kitchen was filled with an amazing hop aroma. So just trying to give myself, you know, that background hop aroma to reprogram my brain there. And, uh, by the way, I logged my brew session in my 2007 Brewer's Logbook. How's that for a a segue to shameless promotion? (laughs) We've still got some logbooks left, and uh, we're starting to get feedback uh, from those of you who have picked them up. So if you haven't already, check them out at basicbrewing.com. Com. Now, next week, David Myers from Redstone Meadery will join us to fill us in on the International Mead Festival, and he'll give us some advice on our next mead experiment that we're planning for Basic Brewing Video. And by the way, uh, the, the uh, current episode of Basic Brewing Video is out there with uh, Steve and, and uh, me, Steve and I, talking about smoky beers and Steve whipping up some just amazing food. Uh, If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say hey, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. And while you're on our site, you can check out our online shop where you can find great pricing on our DVDs and a combo deal to, uh, to save you even more. In our first DVD, Introduction to Extract Home Brewing, We walk you through the extract brewing process step-by-step from boiling to bottling. And in our our second DVD, Basic Brewing Stepping into All Grain, we take you through the all grain process from milling your grain to collecting your wort. And we do it in that nonlinear way that uh, you can choose your path uh, and 
either choose infusion mashing or step mashing, and then you can choose either step, um, fly sparging or batch sparging. So you don't have to watch it all at one time. You can come back and, and choose the stuff to watch. You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. If, and if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order it online straight from us, and I'll pack it up myself. And be sure to look for that logbook. And uh, thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link, by the way. Uh, we appreciate the support. And as a bonus to, uh, to those of you who listen to the end of the show, here's a, a new show feature that I'm going to start doing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be randomly listing items purchased through that link here at the end of the show. Now, keep in mind, I can't tell who bought what, so, but, it's, but it's fun to see what people are buying. This week's featured items, Black & Decker's 18-volt pivoting nose cordless hand vac and the guide to owning a ragdoll cat. So there you go. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that's all until next week. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson down in Austin, our logo designer as well. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long.